Welcome, everyone. Uh, we will be starting in just a moment. Um, I think everyone should be on mute, but if not, um, if you could do that, that would be great. Um, and again, uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so greetings. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to Photo Poetry Surfaces. I'm Dave Solo, your host and moderator for the evening, uh, co-organizer of the program, and a Brooklyn-based, and as some of you know, obsessive collector and explorer of photo and visual poetry books. Uh, many thanks to my partners on this project, Astra Papa Christodoulou and Paul Hawkins. And on behalf of all of us, many thanks to the Bristol Photo Festival, especially Alex and Tracy, and to the artists and their publishers who generously shared their work and are joining us tonight. The Bristol Photo Festival is a community interest company and therefore reliant entirely on support from donations, sponsorship, and funders such as Arts Council England. All donations towards the ongoing work of the festival and our work moving into a second edition would be gratefully received. You can donate by PayPal via the website bristolphotofestival.org and the link should be appearing any second in the chat window. We're happy to welcome you all to this evening or afternoon or other time of day, exploring a slice of photo and visual poetry and celebrating the launch of both the virtual exhibition and physical catalog for photo poetry surfaces. Um, again, the link to the website and the exhibition should now be live. The information on the catalog and the festival should all be in the chat um, any minute now, again, if they're not already. Uh, we, of course, had very much hoped that we'd all be in a room tonight um, enjoying these works and uh, most of all the pub afterwards. And we do hope that future versions will indeed be both physical and virtual. Uh, the structure for the evening will start with a panel conversation about photo and visual poetry uh, for about 30 minutes, uh, followed by presentations by eight artists or artist duos covering a range of photography and poetry work. Um, at the end, we'll open this up to Q&A and invite you to enter questions at any time into the chat window uh, during the event. We'll aim to wrap up in about 90 minutes or so at around 8.30 p.m. UK time. Uh, this event is being recorded um, and all attendees at least are supposed to remain muted throughout, uh, but please feel free uh, to chat, show your appreciation for the artists, comment in the chat window, and let folks know where you're joining us from. Uh, while we can't all meet up afterwards tonight, uh, we will be putting a link in the chat window towards the end uh, for a Zoom hallway or virtual pub or whatever we want to call it uh, for anyone who isn't exhausted and would like to continue the conversation informally. Um, and uh, again, alas, you'll have to bring your own refreshments. Uh, but now on to the event. The is John. Uh Oops. Um, oh. Sorry. Sorry. Just looking for one more set of folks. There we go. Um, so the first part of the program will be a panel discussion um, exploring some of the range and history of photo poetry. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome our panelists, Chris McCabe, Federica Chiochetti, and John Nichols and Kate Wang. Chris McCabe's work crosses art forms and genres, including poetry, fiction, nonfiction, drama, and visual art. His work has been shortlisted for the Ted Hughes Award and the Republic of Consciousness Prize. His most recent collection is The Triumph of Cancer, 2018, which is a Poetry Book Society recommendation. And his most recent novel is Mud, 2019, a version of the Orpheus and Eurydice myth set beneath Hampstead Heath. He is the co-editor of The New Concrete, Visual Poetry for the 21st Century, and editor of Poems from the Edge of Extinction, an anthology of poetry endangered languages. John Nichols is the Director of Arts and Creativity at Thomas Callis School in London. He is a teacher of photography and co-creator of photo pedagogy and art pedagogy. In his spare time, John enjoys making photographs and has recently published two books of photo poetry, 
all of it in 2020 and last things in 2021 with his poet wife, Kate Ling, who is also joining. Kate's pamphlet, Balcony, is published by Agnes Kirk Press and was chosen as a staff pick for the National Poetry Library in Day. She won the Flamingo Feather Prize in 2014 with her long poem, Deptford Creek, and was a winner in the Frogmore Poetry Prize in 2016. Her poems have appeared in numerous anthologies and an ambit, Brittle Star and Magma. Kate is a teacher of students with autism in a comprehensive school, also in London. Writer, curator, editor, and lecturer, Federico Chiappetti, specializes in photography and literature. Through her platform, Photo Captionist, she collaborates with international institutions, such as Photo Museum Winterthur, Jeux de Palme, and FOAM. She recently completed her PhD, Photo Texts, Critical Intersections in History, at London's University of Westminster, and her writings have appeared in Lomo Vogue and Aperture's Photo Book Review. So to begin this part, um, as the photo poetry genre might be a bit new to some of you, uh, well, perhaps to everyone since it only sort of barely exists as a thing, uh, we'd like to begin by sharing a few examples uh, that suggest the range of these forms. Oops. There we go. So to begin with, um, I will start off with a couple historical examples. Photo poetry goes back pretty much to the dawn of photography, uh, with the first publication likely around 1850, and an er even earlier photo by Constance Fox Talbot of a poem. Most of these early examples were illustrated editions of literature, especially the romantic poets, with photographs replacing engravings. Uh, this example is The Lady of the Lake by Sir Walter Scott in an 1865 edition by A.W. Bennett, probably the largest publisher of such work at the time, and with photographs by George Washington Wilson, who was a fairly prolific uh, photographer doing uh, photographs for a number of books. The images are essentially illustrative at this period, a picture of a castle next to a text about a castle, um, et cetera. And here is another example with a photo of Sterling Castle, again, next to a relevant text. Mechanical reproduction and other printing technologies uh, enabled much more interesting work. Um, and this book is Photo Poems, a book by Constance Phillips from 1936 which pairs her photographs with poetry selections from an assortment of poets. Uh, the book may be the first use of the term photo poem, um, and the preface lays out principles encouraging work that provokes rereading and reinterpretation through the pairings, uh, with the quote shown on the screen. Uh, this is an example paired with a poem by Wordsworth, and on the following uh, section, uh, or the following slide, uh, work from Fitzgerald and Stevenson. Um, so see, these are some of sort of early steps in the evolution of, of the genre. Uh, but now we will move um, into a more contemporary period uh, and turning it over to John and Kate. Hi, everybody. So we've chosen to share Hillside, further selections from the archive of Bernard Taylor from Understory Books, Autumn 2020. This little book and its largest history of the archive of Bernard Taylor, published in 2021, are complex and multi-layered and impossible to describe in three minutes. However, we hope to whet your appetites and would encourage you to get hold of both volumes. They're extraordinary. We want to focus on Hillside because it's a fine example of the photo poetry genre. 16 pages long, contains 15 black and white landscape photographs, three poems, and an editor's note. Photographs appear to have been taken by a Bernard Taylor, and the book edited by Peter Ward. Ward informs us that Taylor, the deceased photographer, was a resident of the village of Hastings-on-Hudson in New York, his front door facing one of the entrances to the nearby woods. The black and white photographs are beautifully printed studies of trees and shrubs, mixture of shallow, focused, detailed, and more expansive shots of the parkland, clearly indicating traces of human presence and the effects of weather and time. We're given glimpses of the sky, but the general mood is one of quiet, secluded communion with nature. They display an extraordinary level of technical skill and knowledge of the traditions of landscape photography. Bernard Taylor must have been a very passionate amateur. 
The okay, first let, is, sorry, sorry, just let me know whenever you want me to advance slides. So yeah, whenever you, whenever you want to, David. Okay. The first, uh, sorry, yes, the first poem appears opposite a photograph of a vine tangled tree trunk, perfect. And contains the phrases twisted vine and viney retinue. Lay out as no, no. usual. Experienced readers of poetry familiar with the work of the Ulipo might recognize it as a form called elementary morality uh, invented by Raymond Kinnow. The second poem again appears opposite a scene of entanglement, a mid-toned, skyless composition of fragile tree stems. We might notice this poem is an acrostic, which spells out the phrase, there is no Bernard Taylor. Doubts begin to surface. The wood contains a secret, but can we disentangle it? The words and phrases in the final poem may return us to something reassuringly familiar. Readers of Wallace Stevens may notice the similarity with the snowman. One must have a mind of winter from the snowman is paired in hillside with winter minds that bow as frost. The clear borrowing from Stephen's poem might also be an Olympian strategy. So where does this leave us? Our walk through the woods has left us a little confused and distrustful. If we turn to the archive of Bernard Taylor, we might notice that the publishers afterwards, the second edition is dated spring 2024. It contains even more complex combination of photographs, prints, maps, and texts. Confused? Who wouldn't be? We might begin to pose questions such as, if there's no Bernard Taylor, who is Peter Wood? Who would publish the work of a man who doesn't exist? What does this work suggest to us about the relationship between poems and photographs? What's the role of the reader in this context? Who is the implied audience for a work like this? What does seem clear is that the reader, viewer, listener, is integral to the meaning making process. We may begin to suspect that this might all be a fabulous concoction by photographer, publisher and antiquarian bookseller Tom Leckie. We turn back to the beginning of the book and revisit the woods with a fresh sense of our agency and creativity, the sign of great photo poetry. Thank you. Um, Federica. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, so photo poetry has been uh, a, a very important section of my PhD. Uh, I have been investigating especially Bertolt Brecht's uh, war primer. And then thanks to the collaboration uh, with David Solo on his photo poetry books collection, I became more and more intrigued by those concrete or visual poetry that incorporates photography. And research after research, I investigated, especially the Italian roots, the futurist roots, from words at liberty to the forerunner of concrete poetry, Carlo Belloli, uh, with his mural poetry theorized visual poetry for the first time in 1944. And uh, the image that you see here is actually um, an incredible uh, female artist, uh, visual poet. Uh, her name is Ketty La Rocca who belong to the uh, Gruppo Settanta in Florence uh, of uh, visual poetry, Poesia Visiva. And she started um, by uh, making uh, these um, uh, extremely uh, feminist and critical uh, collages um, that uh, I wonder actually if uh, uh, other artists such as Barbara Kruger uh, are familiar with them and were perhaps inspired by those. For example, this one here says, uh, intellectuals in college, um, if you're bored, why don't you eat a woman? And so from uh, uh, this kind of very feminist uh, approach, as uh, in her own words, um, she said, it is not the time for women to make declaration. They have too much to do. Uh, and then they would have to use a language that is not theirs within a language that is as alien to them as it is hostile. Uh, from these uh, early uh, verbal visual um, 1960s um, collages, she then moved, uh, David, if you could put the next slide, <laughs> uh, into um, um, experimenting more and more um, 
with uh, combining um, photography and uh, and her own handwriting. In this case, for example, we see this is a very uh, rich and charged um, um, photo concrete poetry image where you can see in the middle, the main subject is uh, um, Manna, who was the very first professor of uh, uh, contemporary art history in Italy in the University of Salerno. Uh, visiting an exhibition, so you can probably recognize in the background the famous um, twins picture from Dianabus, and then he's in front of uh, Michelangelo Pistoletto's mirror, and then the artist Ketty La Rocca decided to contour uh, with her own handwriting uh, and the word you, 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 um, uh, the uh, the figures and the images as to create as if in these images everything that really mattered to her was condensed and she wanted to create uh, this uh, uh, sentimental uh, connection uh, between uh, the art the, the, the art historian and the artist that she really uh, admire uh, if you could put the next one um, Thank you. Uh, sadly, she uh, died at the age of 38 in 1976 of a cancer. And so she found out early on about her disease and she started a two series uh, which are quite incredible and mingle uh, photography and, and concrete poetry. Uh, one is called uh, Reductions. Uh, where she started from um, a photograph that she could find at a flea market or uh, sometimes she uses images that belong to the history of photography such as the uh, Julia Margaret Cameron and then she um, juxtaposed uh, with her own handwriting the reproduction of the contours of, of, the, uh, of the photograph uh, and then in the third, um, in the third, so these are triptychs normally, or sometimes even longer of like uh, four or five uh, sets of images, just lines. So as if um, in a way uh, she stripped the visual elements uh, from the original image has to arrive uh, through language uh, to only uh, lines and signs, uh, really to kind of challenge and play with perception. And this is in very interesting because it mingles two series, not only the reduction series, but also the cra cranial x-rays. So as she found out about her disease, she started working with x-rays of her own uh, crane and juxtapose them uh, with her hands um, and then uh, handwrite uh, uh, initially very repetitive words such as you as we saw before but then also more complex uh, uh, poems uh, to then dissolute them into uh, lines uh, and, and shapes. Thank you. Um, uh, and Chris I think you were going to um, sort of wrap up this part and unmute. Thank you, David. Can you see that and hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so really picking up from Federica's presentation there, uh, my background is um, very much in concrete visual poetry. Um, so I'm going to take a cue from that and attempt a three minute essay, um, taking the minimalist cue from, from the concrete poets. And I've chosen to show just a couple of images. Um, the first one is a classic concrete poem and I want to show how that moved into photographic inclusion or representation in concrete poetry. Um, the concrete poetry movement began roughly around 1953 and links between European and Brazilian poets uh, formalized soon after. Um, the German poet Eugen Gomringer created this work, Silencio, in 1954. As with many early concrete works, it's concerned with the graphic representation of words or a word or sometimes just letters on a page suggesting that language in itself can become a thing. Silencio achieves this by creating a void at the center of the words, which stands in 
for the semantic element of the poem's meaning. In its early phase, the Brazilian concrete poets used photography as a way of galvanizing the movement and creating a media presence. Here are three of the Brazilian poets, including Augusto de Campos on the right there, um, posing with the kind of curl of a maybe a post-punk band or something like that. Um, in 1964, Augusto de Campos began to experiment with what he called Poemas Popcretes. As the title suggests, these poems were influenced by pop art and evolve cutting up mass media images and collaging them into concrete forms. Olo por olo, eye for eye, stacks a series of images shaped into a tower structure. Is this perhaps suggesting the Tower of Babel? Concrete poetry aspires to rebuild what has been lost in language, particularly after the Second World War. But does this work also reference the building of Brasilia, the new utopian capital of Brazil, which was first conceived as an idea in 1956? The architect Lucia Costa wrote a pilot plan for the city, which would influence the Brazilian poet's own pilot plan for concrete poetry in 1958. The idealism ended in 1964 when a military dictatorship took over Brazil, the same year as this work was created. Word replaced with image, Helvetica with scissors. Are the shifting averted eyes a commentary on dystopia, control and surveillance? And as we work down the image from the traffic signs at the top, giving us directions or blocking our directions, uh, does this suggest control over the fragments of bodies and their desires that appear underneath? The image allows eyes to dominate over mouths. Is this a play on visuality, replacing the oral history of poetry? And why are the largest eyes at the bottom of the image looking to the viewer's right? Is there something approaching, a sense perhaps of imminent danger? Uh, just to conclude, in an early version of this work, Augusto de Campos included a quote at the bottom of the work. Um, and as always, his roots were in literary modernism. Um, and the words were simply, no tongues, all eyes, be silent. Thank you, David, back to you. Many thanks. And, and thanks to, to everyone for the examples uh, and sort of kicking off the, the event. Um, thinking about what we just looked at um, for the exhibition catalog and program, we've selected a spectrum of work ranging from pairing of poem and photo to various forms of visual poem to video poems and, and poem objects. Uh, do you think of these as distinct genres um, or as variations on a theme? And how might the reader and, and viewer engage differently with these sort of different ways of, of bringing text and image together? And maybe Chris, if you want to kick that off and, and then let others jump in. Sure, I think it's a really interesting question. And I would approach that by saying that the need to create these works and the need as humans to engage with them uh, comes from the same place. And it's a desire to combine the textual and the visual. Um, Dick Higgins, uh, the intermediate artist, wrote about this and collected thousands of examples of pattern poetry. And they were all coming from the same place. We have a need as human beings to, to combine together the visual world and the textual world. So in that sense, they are very similar and they satisfy that need. Um, you know, I think we do need to see the different histories, perhaps in photo poetry, and visual poetry, visual poetry goes back to 300 BC, right back to ancient Greece. Photo po poetry is relatively new, as we just heard. Um, and, you know, there is a tradition that is different in each of them, but I think there's an overlap of what these works ask us to do. And we could probably go into that in you know, a lot of detail about the specifics of what each work demands, but um, maybe that's enough just to start us off. Shall I go? <laughs> sure. 
Okay, uh, but it's very difficult because uh, I am divided in between the academic and the um, consumer uh, exhibition goer and, and visitor and reader. Uh, so, of course, uh, you know, academia exists as to, in order to categorize, historicize, uh, label everything and, and identify genres, sub, sub genres and create these structures. But uh, as we saw with uh, photo poetry, concrete poetry, um, they, uh, they really do overlap. And I think that's very healthy actually. And it's good obviously to uh, familiarize with, uh, uh, so I, I see the, the photo text, I see word and image as a discipline, then the photo text as a sort of genre, and then within, within that genre, photo poetry is a sort of subgenre. But these are just very structuralist, uh, kind of dusty <laughs> categories. So I think as a, as a, as a reader, as a viewer, um, the, the most important thing is to really enjoy uh enjoy this third something that creates in your mind when you look at the words uh and sorry you do the words and you look at the images do you want to say something about sound yeah i was thinking about um from hillside in particular the way that reading a poem is a different experience to looking at a photograph so you're reading and then you're looking and if you do those things separately they're quite separate experiences but in a photo poetry book you're doing both of those things and you're flipping between them and so the experiences of both ways of reading begin to overlap so for example in a hillside uh, one poem ends towards the snow listener who attunes to nothing 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 and the middle nothing is in brackets and there's a space for the last nothing and those nothings are in your ear and your your poet's ear is, li is listening to those you've made up that voice in your head and that voice then goes with you into the next poem so what would ordinarily be a sign uh go into the photograph rather so what would ordinarily be a silent photograph and a silent reading of a photograph becomes something with sound so um you are creating that sound you become very conscious of yourself as a reader because you're aware that I'm reading a poem, I'm reading a photograph, and when those things start to overlap, you're more conscious of yourself being engaged, you become a collaborative collaborator in those works because you're conscious of what you're doing in a way that you're not always conscious if you're just doing one of those things at a time. John and Kate, maybe following up a little bit on that, as you're also makers of, of work, um, how much do you think the sort of mode of collaboration and, and that process um, shapes the work and how much would you want sort of the reader of it to know kind of about you know how the sausage is made so to speak you know whether it's kind of a back and forth or an active partnership etc um i i think the most important thing is is the is is how active we we need the readers to be and I think all makers of photo poetry really rely on the reader, viewer, listener. I think I quite like that combination of descriptors for the participants in photo poetry because you really need them to be um, actively involved in making meaning. And I suppose, I suppose in Tom Leckie's work, which you know, I know you know quite well, David, that's a really important uh, feature. You know, a, a photo poetry book is a kind of a puzzle, and and we're 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 presenting reader, viewers, listeners with with work to do you know and it's it's uh, we rely on that work being done and in his case of course the the origin of the making uh, leaks out slowly as you consume the texts and and you're left with lots of questions and, and those questions are part of the motivation for wanting to go on and reread and rediscover the work um i'm not always sure it's important to know the nature of the collaboration but if once you do know i think it's a really interesting feature of your understanding of the work and maybe adds a, another dimension and chris I, also as a, a maker of work um you know do you have thoughts as well on, on sort of how the, the the collaboration style ends up shaping both the, the making and reception of the work yeah um 
for me, there's always a fair presence, or not usually a fair presence, um, which will be uh, a dead luminary of some sort. So you know, um, the collaboration in the anthology is um, with William Blake, as, as well as the two makers of the work. Um, and you know, the last collaboration I did um, was was back in in Munich. Uh, and it was with a German um, concrete poet and sound performer called Mikkel Lentz. And we were trying to make the work and, it, you know, it was OK. But I noticed there was a book behind me by Ernst Jandl, the incredible Austrian uh, concrete poet. And we, we connected this artist and we allowed that artist into the work, riffing off one of his techniques. And it lifted everything. We suddenly had a three-way conversation happening um uh, through our excitement of, of previous you know brilliance really um and i think you know it is for me more more than just the two people in that in that very moment um it, it can be wider than that and more interesting than that sort of looking across the spectrum how do you think about sort of evaluating um uh, works in this space and, and what makes them successful, uh, both in terms of the overall result, perhaps the role of sort of the technical execution in that uh, for both the poem, the photograph, and where it's in book form, uh, sort of the design of, of the overall object. Uh, Federica, I, mean, I don't know if you want to kick that sort of topic off. Uh, sure. Uh... I must admit that success uh, is a very capitalist word that I don't really <laughs> necessarily Feel free like. to substitute another <laughs> word. <laughs> but um, I think, um, I mean, it's obviously, it's very, it's both very subjective, but also there are some uh, ways to, uh, as, as you know, David, when, while we were looking at so many photo poetry books, we would uh, happen to um, find or agree on uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the times on some of them that were kind of like boring, predictable, where the image text dynamics is probably too literal, uh, too um, hierarchical, uh, so I think, first of all, what makes exciting is uh, the, the image text dynamic, how images and words relate to each other. And of course, if the, the, the relationship is subtle, ambiguous, mysterious, I think it adds uh, to the... Um, uh, it increases the curiosity and the pleasure uh, of, uh, of spending time with those works. Uh, also, one last thing, and then I'll, 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 I want to hear uh, my colleagues. Um, I think it's, um, uh, for example, for me, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a lot about um, if there is somehow a sort of political um narrative behind the, the the mingling of images and words i think that it's not a coincidence uh, as one of uh, um uh, the, the phototextual experts uh, in italy andrea cortelesa uh, noted that um the um, the field like the, the theme of uh, phototextual collaborations uh, are often related to themes of conflict such as war patriarchy feminism uh, but this is obviously very personal so when a work deals with this subject matter uh, especially in a conceptual way i find it super amazing but that's because i like that kind of stuff of course And Chris, I mean, you've been, again, both a, a maker and a curator, um, and, you know, recently you've been looking at selections from Instagram. You know, how, how do you think about sort of making some of these selections? Um, well, it depends on the scope of the project. When I was editing or co-editing The New Concrete, we were very, Victoria Bean and I were very interested in contemporary work that had taken the core ideas from concrete poetry. Um, and we used to have this um, this uh, phrase that we would use when we were looking at works, 
and we would we would ask each other can this work be made in a, any other way um, and of course it's a bit of a false question because any work could be made in a different way um, but there was something quite useful for us in beginning to critique the work um, you know if we felt that um, a, a minimalist poem could have been done like this or like that. It seems to move away from the uh, really concrete ideal of the words replacing the object, if, if you like. Uh, but that, that was one particular project. You know, it, Insta Instagram poetry is huge. Uh, and Instagram poetry is basically photographs of every single kind of poetry that you can think of um, placed on Instagram. Um, you know, so that, you know kind of approach of could it be done in a different way doesn't doesn't quite apply and my approach to that was more about um energy and and color um and about originality and about ideas so it was far more based on intuition than some kind of critical um perception of, of, that, of that particular work um but it is difficult you know i think um visual poetry every work aspires to be its own thing and it's always been a part of it you know, it shouldn't be like anything else. It should be unique. Um, and it falls right down the crack between visual art and literature. And it doesn't really get um, full attention by either in the academy. Thanks. Well, we're, we're just about, unfortunately, running out of time for this part of the program. But any final comments from any of the, the three or four, excuse me, of you uh, before we sort of move on? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, we were thinking a lot about what makes a successful photo poetry book and the ones that we own, we've kind of scrutinised in terms of whether we think they're successful or not. Um, and it's an interesting question because all of the ones we've got are doing different things. And I think what all of them have in common is perhaps a sense of fragility and a sense that um, they actually could not work. It's, that it's quite palpable to the degree to which they could be unsuccessful. Um, and we've got a good quote about that from Alex Stoth. Yeah, so I, I know lots of people in the, um, in the audience will know Alex Stoth's work. And he recently made a video about in which he discussed this great work of photo poetry. So this is um, really Burkhart and Edwin Denby's New York New NY. But he says in, in the video, I've often said that photographs and poetry don't work together. It's a huge generalization and not actually accurate, but it sometimes makes me uncomfortable. And the reason is that they're like two positive forces that bounce off each other. And for it to work, I think it requires both the photography and the poetry to be, to be simplified and more common. It often feels pretentious to have fancy photographs and fancy poetry together. And uh, I think I generally agree with that statement. Well, that seems like a fine note to, to wrap up this part. Um, so uh, many thanks to the four of you. Uh, we may all come back together uh, towards the end for the, the Q&A session. Uh, but um, with that, um, I think we'll, we'll wrap up this piece and sort of move on to part two. Uh, so again, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we You're will... welcome. Thank you. So for uh, part two, uh, and while well, I try to do too many things at once, uh, with that foundation, we'd now like to invite uh, several of the artists from the exhibition and catalog to present and perform their work. Uh, these will unfortunately be brief samples, and we very much would encourage you to explore their terrific work further. It's been a real pleasure to see here and learn more about uh, the, these bodies of work and links to the books and sites for all the artists, uh, along with their full bios, are included on the exhibition website, the link to which has been uh, posted regularly in the, the chat window. Um, I will do a very short intro uh, for each artist or, or artist duo, and then ask them to very briefly introduce their work, um, including maybe a brief comment or two on how they approach combining word and image, and whether via collaboration, or individually, and how they might imagine it being read uh, before, in fact, moving on to, to showing or reading the work. Uh, we'll aim to keep sort of each section to about seven minutes or so. And so, as with all such events, uh, our fingers are crossed that it goes smoothly um, and asking for your indulgence for the inevitable glitches. Uh, but also, do feel free to keep commenting and showing your appreciation in the uh, chat window. 
So first up are Tom Hicks and Liz Berry. And let me find them. Um, uh, too far away. Um, Tom Hicks is the artist behind the ongoing documentary photography project Black Country Type. His work has been exhibited widely, most recently in a solo exhibition at Wolverhampton Art Gallery in 2020. Liz Berry's first book of poems, Black Country, from Chatto in 2014, described as a sooty soaring hymn to her native West Midlands by The Guardian, was a Poetry Book Society recommendation, received a Somerset Mom Award, and won the Jeffrey Faber Memorial Award and Forward Prize for Best First Collection in 2014. So welcome and over to Tom and Liz. Uh, you're muted, Tom. Yep, you there you me now? Can you see what? Can you see my screen as well? Okay. Well, thanks for asking us along. Um, my name is Tom Hicks. I'm here with Liz Berry to talk about our collaboration. Um, so um, I've been uh, working on a documentary photography uh, series um, based in the Black Country region. Um, people don't know where it is. It's a uh, it's an area in the West Midlands in England, and it's uh, really classed as a post-industrial area. Um, a lot of my photography is, it centers on place. Um, and it's really, although there's no people or portraits of people in, in the imagery, um, most of the work is concerned with people and the kind of traces they leave, really. Um, I. Um, First heard of Liz when she was on Radio 6 Music um, on the BBC. Um, and she was reading from her poetry and talking about um, the black country generally. But um, it was nice for me to hear a, a voice from the region that I'm from. Um, one thing that she uh, mentioned was uh, the idea of maybe working with another art form. So for both of us, I think photo poetry is quite a new concept. And, and perhaps at one point we, we thought we were doing something completely new, but obviously this, this festival has shown us something different. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so um, how we work together is um, I send batches of photographs to Liz, uh, although we don't live very far away from each other, we don't walk around together. Um, I send the batches of photography and she starts to, to sift through it and see what appeals to her. Um, I think what's interesting is, um, you know, she's given a voice to the region in terms of um, poetry and I'm, I'm sort of focusing on it in terms of imagery. Um, so it's kind of lucky that we met and combined really, I think. Um, the working method I've got really is, is around cycling. So I cycle around the, the region, sometimes walk, um, but I think cycling in particular gives a different viewpoint. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and driving, for example, if you see an image uh, or a, a, a site, it's hard to turn around quickly, uh, particularly in this area, given the traffic. Um, so cycling allows for that shift in, in kind of uh, movement to go and take the photograph. Um, the methods really in the work are kind of informed by psychogeography in terms of the idea I don't go out with a set uh, venue in mind. It's about drifting around and seeing what I see, really. Um, so it's it's mainly uh, kind of urban work, really. Um, and I think what what's worked well with myself and Liz is the fact that our, our imagery com complements each other's work. Um, she gives kind of a really strong voice to the area. Um, without becoming a dialect poet, she doesn't actually fill up her poems with um, the black country dialect, which is quite distinct, um, but she does use it within her work, and I think that works well. Um, so what I'll do is hand over to Liz now, and she can tell you a little bit more about her, her working method. Thank you. Um, 
Thanks, Tom. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Liz Berry, poet from the Black Country. What I really loved about Tom's images, and you can probably see a few of them here, is their really unpeopled nature. So Tom's really interested in exploring this idea of dereliction in the Black Country of the secret places. And I think I pick up almost where Tom lives off. He photographs the traces of human life, whereas I'm fascinated by those voices and the spirits of the places, how they might speak if we were to step there a moment before or a moment after the people that we might find. So I always start with Tom's image and then work from there into the voices of the place. It's the voices that are here. So it's really interesting to hear Kate talking before about the sounds of the poems. We haven't spoken yet, have we, about what an oral thing poetry is. And so often I think that sometimes it's, you might read the poem aloud or hear the poem read out loud at the same time as seeing the image. So we've published um, the collaboration so far in journals like Poetry Review and Ambit Magazine and made a photo book for The Modernist. And we're now working towards a longer book called The Dereliction for Hercules Editions. So I'll just read two poems now. Um, along with Tom's photos that are part of that project. This first poem is called Fertility Deity. Tom took this gorgeous photo of a, a scratched and carved silver birch tree on a housing estate in the black country. And I imagined what voice this gorgeous woman curved in the middle might have. Fertility Deity Silver Birch Bradmore Estate. When the moon rises like a pearl spat from the throat of the dark, into my cops they fly, the girls, in twos and threes, their stink of violets and iron seeping through the night. They wear trainers and flimsy boots, their hair untied and brushed to wild static, as they kneel in wet soil, mud flowers blooming on the knees of their jeans to push feathers into my bark, red rags, bent pins, berry rings of soft hair where milk caps thrust. They are dreaming of fucking, called loving, called courting. Little queens of the fallen pit banks and estates whose lights spangle the hills on frozen dusks. The canopy whispers and crackles. Their voices are the calls of siskins and red poles, their pupils blown, phones ring dead in their tight back pockets. Sometimes they are older, solitary. Their mouths kissed to my scored V, wetting the scars to beg a child to come. They hold my name between their teeth as the vixen holds the hot scruff of their cob. This is now place for men. He who carved me with the blade of a shiv to my bark will never return. It is women who rise like birches from the dirt, candescent with longing. And the final poem is um, the one that accompanies this gorgeous photo, Yam Yam's Diner. It's nice to know that Yam Yams is sort of a humorous, affectionate name for um, people from the black country. In this poem, I sort of imagine my other secret life. Yam Yams Diner. Somewhere beyond all this, I'm elbows down on the counter in Yam Yams Diner. Sunflower oil slick in my ponytail. Ruby t-shirt, blue apron. Our lady of perpetual sucker, all a hard-working man might stoop to kiss the knuckles of, stagger out in the diesel yellow morning yearning to taste, serving a little chick and bab, tea slurry with sugar, bacon with a sly crisp of skin, bread thick as a dictionary flip to the entry, clam to jet. And I'd love them, the men. In their overalls and boots you could stamp on the towels of. The tired ones, the trodden, the young, their chins still soft with bum fluff. I'd hold their dreams, 
so tenderly. Understanding that there's no heaven but this, a grease-spangled porter cabin, the roin, the body yields when it's finally full. So get it whilst you can. By three, I'll be gone. Tables wiped, shutters down. Already feeling the afternoon sun on that soft, bare spot on my nape. The scent of fat and salt swinging like incense as I pull out the pins and let loose my hair. Thanks so much. Thank you both. That was terrific and, and a great start to the, the evening. Uh, yeah. Oops. Next up, uh, we have uh, Sarah Cave and Dragon Adrisic. And just a second here. we go. Sarah Cave is a writer, uh, artist, and academic. She has published three pamphlets, two collections, and a co-authored collection of poems, as well as several handmade artist books. Her visual poetry has been exhibited online at Poem Atlas, as well as the Poetry Society, Westminster Reference Library, and the Fish Factory. She is the co-editor of Willamot Press, which I usually mispronounce, which won the Michael Marks Publishers Award in 2018. Uh, born in the former Yugoslavia and now in Dublin, uh, Dragan Adrosic is an assistant professor at Dublin City University. Working primarily with image and text, she has shown her work extensively and won many awards. Her first book, You, The Lost Country, was published in 2015, and her photo poetry book, Museum, a collaboration with Paul Amian, came out in July 2019. So thank you very much. Um, and over to Sarah and Dragana. Hi. So I will start uh, first, if you don't mind, then maybe if David, you're sharing the presentation. Great. Whoops. So great, that's perfect. So at the beginning, oh they're really <laughs> no 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 I it, I have to go back to the beginning of it. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um I promised a few glitches along the way. Yeah. Tell me what to Hang on a minute. Let me stop this. Let me stop and restart it. Sorry. No worries. All right, there we go. Great, thank you. So the first time I heard about this collaboration was when I was contacted by Gregory McCartney, who is um, editor of a bridge magazine. And a bridge magazine is based in Northern Ireland, and it actually specializes in publications that uh, that look at image text. So they publish uh, art, visual art and poetry together, and. Um, he contacted me and asked me to participate in, in a project that he already titled The Merits of Tracer Fire and gave me quite a wide brief that it was about coding and algorithms. And um, I started thinking about what I'm going to do. And he told me that uh, Sarah Cave is going to be commissioned to write poetry for the book. Uh, so we were kind of uh, not necessary uh, working together, but we did discuss what was happening and, and about a process. Um, there was another person uh, who was commissioned, and that was uh, Daryl Martin. He's a young composer based in Northern Ireland, um, and he has synesthesia. So he was supposed to, uh, he, he, he responded kind of to some of the selected images I created uh, with his music. And, um, I find, you know, when I gave myself a task of photographing internet, I was like, I don't even know what that means, really. So to make my life more difficult, I started 
photographing kind of the most common things on the internet, like cut and porn and viral videos, using Polaroid camera that could neither focus nor compose image. So when I would press the shutter, a totally surprising frame would come up. Um, and I think I did this to reflect my feelings about uh, the kind of the drowning information that we get from social media. And um, as I was working on the project, I was talking to Sarah, we had a few meetings and she was sharing her poetry with me and I heard my images. And we could kind of see that we were talking about similar things, which was uh, very interesting to me. So I'm not going to talk much further. Maybe later on, I can just uh, say more about image text relationship, but I would like to let Sarah uh, give her version of a cooperation. Thank you. Oh gosh, okay. Um, hi everyone, I'm Sarah. Um, I was also contacted by Greg, uh, probably around about March last year and told, um, a very, very simple brief, um, as Dragan has already said, but I, I've managed to find it. A project that explores how we in our lives and social spaces, both public and domestic, are coded by all pervasive technology mixed with the various social codes that exist. And thus, I worked for about three months <laughs> on my own. Um, before really i i i i i think maybe me and dragana got in touch maybe around about the september mark and started to chat about it and uh the poetry started to make much more sense in <laughs> relation to dragana's work um and also started to almost sort of bend itself towards dragana's work as well um for a long time i was kind of playing around with 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 all sorts of things about the algorithm and i think the algorithm is really really present in the work and and both of us seem to have, have gone down what and joanna really nicely referred to as the rabbit hole when we first met um and that rabbit hole is really important and it's in joanna's work and it's very much in the poetry and earlier i thought it was quite interesting that one of the definitions of bad photo poetry was fancy, well, I, I think it was it fancy poetry and fancy photos. And I feel like my poetry made the definition of fancy um, <laughs> complicated. Both the poetry and the photography is really, I think, quite complicated theoretically. And there's a really nice sense of entanglement between the two of them. Um, for me, uh, for me, I think uh, there's a lot of work to be done to to bring them together. Um, I'm going to just read some poems to the backdrop of uh, to the backdrop of Dragana's work. But first, I'm, I'm going to eject my dog from the room. Sorry. <laughs> I had this uh, situation <laughs> earlier, actually. Um... I, th I think it's a required part of poetry readings yeah, in, in Zoom one. Yeah, dog from the room. But it's, yeah, maybe but while Sari is doing that, I'll just say that I, in my work normally, sorry. yeah, she's back, great. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was um, a palaver. Uh, do you want to carry on, Dragana, and then I'll No, read. no, no, you do it, you do it, you go. You sure? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Um, okay. So this, this is called A Prayer for Summoning Masha. Uh, just to establish that Masha is uh, Maria Aliokna from Pussy Riot. So the poem is dedicated to Pussy Riot. Excuse me, I'm just out of breath. <laughs> I'm running up and down the stairs. The algorithm teaches me a ritual set by the motion of objects in and out and into prayer like a book 
read too quickly. All the information misaligned. Late at night, my reflection sleeps on a dark screen, the last embers of the fire. My triangle of submission wants to protest the icons. I've got a crush in the cathedral. Thesis, alarm, excursion. A grandmother's revolution is a crash of bodies against the marketplace. I've crashed a girl and I like it. I've got a crush. Maria, Maya, Mary, Masha. Falling into the rabbit hole. The rabbit who is always out of time. Removing the belt from her waist was a sin. When falling is a sound like crash. I want her to wait, but she falls. When it isn't time, we think in sync from the kitchen sink, turning the taps, blue for hot, red for cold, the one turning, the one facing, the other. Mimicry as appropriation. Feels just so good, set us free. Rising like skylarks, consoling like swallows, licking like metaphors. Teenage onanism is a crastic response to puritanism. While turning, always falling out of time, not the right time. And if we've got time, I'm just going to read the very last one, which um, just brings me to the other silent collaborator in the work, uh, Luke Thompson from Gillimor Press, who is a fabulous book designer. And uh, Giovanna and I roped him in for designing the book. Um, and he, he's made these amazing Polaroids for the blank Polaroids. Okay, cool. It won't be long. Um, Instagram and the art of object-oriented ritual. Phenomenology is an indulgence, a philosopher moving house. The poetry of being is a moving house of sorts. Sorting out the house begins as hashtag Ponce de hashtag still life with altar boy, smoke rising from the vestry. Place a copy of Bachelard's Poetics of Space under a pillow and listen to the rain. Hashtag cultural capital, hashtag for the rain it raineth. The rain is raining and the sea is falling from the sky and we're listening to the rain fall through the predator's hole, a scallop shell that reveals a violent future. Place a copy of Rousseau's Reveries of the Solitary Walker in the fridge and take a minute to cool down. Hashtag simple life, hashtag no socks, hashtag for the rain it raineth every day. Apple seeds germinate after a cold snap. Place three apple seeds in the fridge and wait for transformation, a retelling of the fool. Yes, says the serpent, cut the flesh from the apple, taken straight from the fridge, cold against the teeth. Uh, hashtag with a hey ho, the wind and the rain. Place a copy of Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle in your child's lunchbox next to the yogurt and the salt and shake. Read the coffee grounds and post images of Baba Yaga moving house with her matryoshka dolls, cored like apples or spit like peaches with their little spoons. Place the vinyl of Leslie Gore's You Don't Own Me in the airing cupboard next to the vacuum cleaner or coal scuttle. Was it all hot air, you and me? Hashtag. For the rain it raineth every day. Rain, rain, rain against the commodification of the pastoral, the anti-pastoral, the hashtag cottage core, the hashtag anti-cottage core. Life is all hashtag silverware in an open cupboard until you find out. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much. That was great. I squeezed it in. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Next up, uh, welcome to uh, Laurent Chevalier. Uh, living and working in New York City, he utilizes photography to shift the frameworks of representative imagery. 
His images seek to dialogue through past, present, and future while continuously contributing new perspectives of Black America and the African diaspora into the canon. He is an inaugural member of the Black Photographer Collective C in Black and the author of Enough, his artist monograph published through Chris Graves Project. He has exhibited across the country and his work has appeared with Vogue, Fast Company, and Huffington Post, among others, and has been collected by the Schomburg, Met Watson, MoMA, Guggenheim, Stanford Green, and Texas State University Libraries. Laurent, all yours. And you're sharing your own, right? <laughs> Yes, I am. Hopefully it works, right? <laughs> All right, let's see here. Can everyone see that? Does that work? Good. Uh, yes. No, okay, perfect. Yeah, so uh, my name is Laurent. I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and my uh, participation in the idea of photo poetry came about through my monograph, uh, which is entitled Enough. And unfortunately, my collaborator couldn't be here today, but I'll do my best to represent for the uh, poetry half of the project. Um, so I actually originally first came across uh, the poet, um, Jamila Liscott, as she's actually, uh, we went to church together and she's a spoken word poet um, initially. And that was how I first became aware of her work was actually hearing her perform and speak her work live. Um, and at the time, I'd already started working on this body of work, which was meant to be basically, uh, in a way, a portrait of the Black community, specifically in New York City, but created in such a way that it was um, wide enough to find the experience across the country. Um, so when I was making that work, I've always felt that poetry and photography were sort of analogous mediums in that, you know, when you're looking, Photography offers the opportunity to show something you may have missed or a different interpretation of what you've already seen. Um, and I felt that poetry did the same thing with language and with communication. And so I always felt that they were things that could work very well together um, when they don't clash and that they could provide different avenues and different ways of seeing, particularly if it's a similar subject matter. So it provided you know, avenues into observation. And so in a way, there's actually two elements of poetry that are included in the book. This first essay of the book was written by um, a poet after he had reviewed the entire pro uh, project that Jamil and I created. But the images and the text itself that's a part of the book came about because, or in the process was, I didn't want there to be a one-to-one -one relationship of poetry to images. I thought that that would be um, less interesting because I wanted there to be more of a through line that connected the images and the poetry in more of a holistic way. So in order to accomplish that, I would basically send the poet collections of images for her to review on her own and for her to find her own inspirations from. And we talked about what we wanted the book to sort of encompass and what we wanted the book to consider. And that was the idea of the experience of Blackness and the urban environment and using that as sort of an analogy for blackness throughout the United States. Um, so in that, once we had that baseline of understanding what we wanted to talk about, we felt free to be able to kind of create a dialogue that allowed each one of us to be free in our respective mediums to create and then come back together and determine what, how those creations sort of mesh together. So in order to create the widest sort of spread of images for her to be able to pull from, I gave her the whole folder of everything that I potentially could use for this project, which was a folder of like 400 images. And she just went through and found the things that inspired her. And she did her own collection as far as, you know, what inspired her, what caused her mind to start going for creating the poetry. But then once she created the poetry, I then went back and went to the images sort of independently and created my story and my a narrative that I wanted to create from the images. Once we did that, then we were able to kind of start bringing in the poetry to determine how the poetry interacted with the images and find points where, you know, sometimes a poem would be very related to the subject matter of a particular image. And then sometimes there were moments where I wanted to make sure that there was that bit of mystery or questioning of what is the relationship because I felt that that was 
more accurate to really the experience that we are trying to portray. You know, often there's things that seem very straightforward and yet are much less so once you actually get into the weeds of it, if you will. And so it was a beautiful thing to be able to receive the work that she wrote and have my own interpretation of it, but then also know that the work that she was creating was inspired by the images that I had created. And so we already had this sort of dialogue, even before we started talking about how the images and the text would come together, because we've already effectively been speaking to each other through you know, our respective work. So for instance, this um, particular poem and pairing of image, I kind of wanted to create somewhat of a sequence of uh, relationship to the poem. So the poem, um, I'll just read it briefly, and I am not the poet, so I cannot claim to perform it in the way that she certainly would. But uh, the poem reads, when you comb your baby girl's kinks and coils, do so without frustration or complaint or derisive language about the task. Otherwise, she will take it in silence. It will nestle itself somewhere between her spirit and her self-esteem. It will be one of her first internal lessons that her natural beauty is something either to be altered or destroyed. And so the image that I decided to pair that with directly is from a beauty supply shop in Brooklyn. And I wanted to kind of create that somewhat complicated relationship between the idea that these shops are places where we actually are able to find a lot of peace and power and comfort in you know, presenting ourselves and finding the particular tools that are necessary to address and present ourselves in the manners that we want to, but also understand that there's a complicated element of that because sometimes there are oppressive modalities that are under that framework that can then affect the children that are coming up next. And that was why I wanted to follow it with the image of the actual girl and the hair out and causing us to hopefully think about, you know, some of those moments when we do see it. Because actually part of also the process for this particular book was all the images were candid captures throughout Brooklyn, throughout New York City, throughout all the five boroughs. And I wanted that to be a very key aspect of it because I felt it important to be able to show what already is and to the least contrived um, element that I could, obviously the presence of the camera always changes and the perspective of a person capturing the image shapes something immediately. But I wanted to include as much of that element of candid observation to show the spaces that are inhabited and the spaces that are navigated. And so she was able to do the same thing with her poetry in highlighting and finding other avenues to be able to explain that relationship. And I'll just jump down to one to close out because it's one of my particular favorite poems that she created. Um, and actually, before I do that, it's interesting, the poem that I will read shortly, I initially connected it very, very strongly with this particular image on the right of the screen. But I realized that there were opportunities to have images that may show similar scenes and be able to create with the uh, pairing of the poetry opportunities for different perspectives of similar scenes to arise. And I think that's important for all of the viewers because that is sort of how we end up shaping how we navigate everything moving forward. You know, we often are living through these similar spaces and scenes, but if we're able to uh, receive additional information and change the perspective on the scene that we ultimately navigate, that helps us then uh, expand our, our viewpoint moving forward. So just remembering that photo, this is the secondary photo that's related that um, it sort of sparked a poem that she wrote that I particularly love. So this would be my <laughs> last performance of her work. Remember that time when we hit the bodega and bought 10 packs of Nowelators and walked to the sprinklers? The fire hydrant is busted open because it's a million degree sprinklers and our lips and hands were all black and blue and red all over and the water made our candy run and we ran to and we laughed and laughed and Miss Jenkins sat there like she'd been on that stoop her whole life and we laughed because she'd been old our whole lives. And remember how you punched that kid in the face for trying to talk to your girl and the whole neighborhood told your mom like words without masters? They walked and talked right to your mom's doorstep and told her you was fighting and you came home 
with hands and lips all black and red and blue, and you went inside and your mom told us that it's no more play today. She said it gently, but there was fear and fury in her eyes, and she closed the door and locked the gate. The door was red. I didn't see you again for a month. So I really love what she was able to do with the interpretation of the images and the dialogue that we were able to create. And I think that that's the beauty of, you know, the sequence of putting these things together and also the beauty of just the, the nature of this medium. The book itself is inspired by another photo poetry um, pairing of Langston Hughes and Rhoda Carava's book, The Sweet Black Paper of Life. And to be able to you know, step into that lineage and try and contribute something uh, along that same spirit was uh, a great process to be able to be a part of and glad to be able to share it with you all today. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a terrific project. So thank, thank you for sharing that. Next up um, is Vic Shirley. Um, her chapbook, Corpses, was published by Sublunary Editions in 2020. Her first full-length collection, The Continued Closure of the Blue Door, was published by HVTN Press in 2021. Oops, I think that should have said 2021, as was her Esther Glock Press book, Disrupted Blue and Other Poems on Polaroids. Her work has appeared in such places as 3AM Magazine, The Rialto, Magma, Shearsman, and Perverse. She is currently studying for a PhD in Dark Humor and the Surreal in Poetry, at the University of Birmingham. So over to Vic. Hi everyone. And um, thank you, Dave and Paul and Astra for um, selecting my work, inviting me to be involved in this. Um, it's a pleasure. I'm not gonna um, go into too much um, detail about the birth of this project. So I'm, I'm, I'm reading from Disrupted Blue and other poems on Polaroid, um, which um, has yeah, just, just come out with, um, with Hester Glock. And um, it is a very um, personal project. Um, yeah, I'm not going into too much detail about the birth of it for that reason, because it can be a little bit upsetting to talk about aspects of it, but it's all in the intro of the book. And, and I will say now that the Polaroid photos that were discarded photos were taken by my mother when she was traveling around Europe and Canada, and that the first half of the book works with lyrics of Joni Mitchell's Blue, which was her favorite album. And the second half of the book um, uh, works with automatic writing, which I generated its early lockdown period. And also um, the places in the pictures aren't unknown. And it's only sort of dawned on me about two minutes ago that in a way this is a collaboration with my mum. And I'm very interested in comments that Dave and Astra and Paul made in the intro um, to the exhibition catalogue um, regarding my work. Dave talked about the pieces being dis disorientated memories and Astra and Paul talked about them um, unravelling nostalgia. Now I think what I've managed to do here in this book um, in these pieces is, whereas I usually in my non-visual um, work. I often write um, surreal, absurd narratives, and I use dark humour and the surreal, which are a very good way as a defence mechanism, emotionally distancing, and work as a uh, very effectively as a double protection to explore darker areas of life. And I think um, here I find another whole new way of emotionally distancing, uh, which has allowed me to explore, you know, very sort of painful subject that wouldn't I wouldn't maybe normally be able to explore otherwise. But by using someone else's words, as material with the Mitchell lyrics um, and the automatic writing too um, it's not directly sort of writing about a subject it's a new way of me uh, sort of flipping it in a playful and experimental way which is better for me um, although with the first half especially it still feels emotionally charged and um, even if trying not to be because it is an emotionally charged um, project so I've realized I've not really spoke to enough about the um, about the actual uh, process um, but um, but there we go so I'm just going to read um, I'm just going to read four from um, the first part and four, uh, sorry, five from the first part and five from the, um, from the second part. <clears throat> Get up, wreck, seesaw my stockings, shampoo my jealousy, knit my greed. Oh, 
and bring me the jukebox so I can hurt you. The form sorrow poem. School tomorrow, a little northern lights, a shamed crocuses spring. A foggy sigh underneath the grass, inside booze, pin waves to guns, acid well, empty me, laughs. Cutting scene hard, I wish, pretty money, naughty baby, quit and cry at Christmas. Well, it's a cocoon 68, three tombs punched, dreaming, cynical, boring lies in fishnet percolator. Damn that figure skater. Central to the town is its ice form. Who is that braying for Coca-Cola? Golden peacocks or peaches, full frontal. Bossa Nova. Marcia sank into a deep sulk. Oh no, epistolary. Preening, sentences, saloon, Slavia, seance. Breakfast pays in drops, inside the, ac the acrobatics hanging in the silence, wetness in surround sound. Thank you. Thank you. That was, uh, it was it's so great to hear those read, having seen them. It's it's uh, it's it's wonderful, um, and and thank you. Thank you. Uh, and and lots of positive comments in the chat when you get to take a look. Uh, next up is James Knight. Uh, he is an experimental poet and digital artist. His visual poetry has been published in journals and anthologies, and has been exhibited at the Poetry Cafe in London and an online exhibition spaces such as Poem Atlas and Mellum Press. His books include Void Voice, excuse me, Void Voices from Hester Glock Press, uh, Self-Portrait by Night, Samson Lowe, Chimera, Pentarac Press, Machine Trickhouse Press, and Disremembered Steel Incisors. James. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, I'm going to try to share my screen. I did uh, practice this the other day. I'll just see if I can remember how to do it now. Oh, here we go. Share content. All right, hang on a sec. Right. I hope this is going to work. Um, so I've got a little presentation and this is going to, uh, here we go. Uh, can, you, can you see that? David, is that showing? It's, it's, it, it is now working. Okay, awesome. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to give you a little slideshow of some of my uh, visual poems. Um, most of them combine um, photographs which have been processed and altered in various ways, um, often to the point of unrecognizability, with, um, with fragmented text. Um, in the case of these ones you're looking at now from a project called Cosmologeria, um, instead of providing um, text in the form of um, words and poet, um, poetry as such, um, these are fragmented forms from theoretical physics, they're, they're equations. Um, because I think theoretical physics 
um, expresses a reality that um, we can't directly see. And I think that's often the work of poetry. And so I thought it'd be interesting to combine some of the beautiful and counterintuitive insights of um, theoretical physics, and quantum physics in particular, with visual poetry. Um, some of these images you're looking at now do contain things you might recognise as a bit, there's an octopus in this one, for example, um, and there's another octopus, there you go. Um, and I'm just, um, I suppose, playfully exploring um, the strangeness of the natural world. All of these, all of these photographs contain, um, all of these poems rather, contain photographs of animals, mostly marine life. Um, I'm interested in showing life in a, in a strange new light, I suppose. That, believe it or not, started off as a photograph of, of a person's head. Um, and then, as you can see, I've, I've processed it in various ways. I, I basically, I smash everything up in my visual poetry. That, that's really what it's about. It's about taking stuff, smashing it up, making it look different, rearranging it, um, adding words which have also been smashed up, or in this case, equations which have been smashed up, and putting them back together. And out of all that brokenness and fragmentation, um, maybe creating something that, that's, that's beautiful or interesting to look at. Um, that was an owl, by the way. The one you can look at now, that, that if you look at it on its side, it started off as a photograph um, of an owl. Um, but yeah, these were a bit unusual in using equations. This is a, this is a bit of a new thing for me. Um, most of my work incorporates um, the written word, um, be it words that I've written myself or cut up text. And I'm going to sh share with you in a minute um, some visual poems from my project Chimera, published by Pentarat Press, um, which involves cut up, some of which comes from um, Bram Stoker's wonderfully naff, The Lair of the White Worm, um, and some of which comes from various sources on biology. Um, Chimera doesn't look like a series of photos, but it is. So everything you, you're, you're about to see started as a photo and then got pulverized into something that doesn't look like a photo and I added text. Essentially, Chimera tells the story of the evolution of an imaginary entity, an imaginary organism. I'm gonna shut up for just a minute and let you watch a bit of that um, evolution. So that gives you a little bit of a, um, a sneaky peek at some parts, at least of Chimera, some of the uh, visual poems that made that up. Um, you can see that there are, there are words there that I've used. I'm just gonna finish with showing you a few bits and bobs that I'm doing at the moment. Um, visual poems which don't use any verbal elements at all. 
in which these kind of biomorphs take take the place of words or language they they I, I kind of see them as the language um, these are actually um, 3d virtual sculptures um, which I've then placed and I've used a, I've used a, a, an exi a photograph as the kind of stage set if you like and done stuff with it and then I've put these um, virtual sculptures I've made into the stage set um, to um, create sort of interesting presences which suggest living entities but also at the same time language as if they they are the language themselves and I suppose that's a kind of a running theme throughout and um, throughout my work is looking at um, you know organisms as as a form of language um, so yes but that's that they're, they're a bit of a work in progress um, so uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll see where all that goes um, I'm just going to stop sharing that now uh, there we go. Okay, but I hope you enjoyed uh, having that look. Uh, thank you very much. Very much, James. Thank you. Uh, great to see. Really terrific. Uh, next up is Astra Papa Christodoulou. Uh, Astra is a poet and artist with focus in the experimental tradition. Uh, she is the author of several poetry pamphlets, including Stargazing with Wilmot Press, Block Play with Hester Glock Press, and her work has been showcased at contemporary visual poetry exhibitions at the National Poetry Library and the Poetry Cafe in London. She is the founder of the visual poetry platform Poem Atlas and is a co-curator and organizer of this event. Astra. Well, thank you, Dave, for that introduction. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be involved in the curation of this event. So lovely to see you all uh, this evening. Um, and, you know, to, to hear about uh, everyone's work, and you know your processes it's fascinating um so i'm going to talk a bit about my uh, project my feathered friend um before i go into the project is itself i'll just give you um a little information into my uh, my work and and um that will hopefully kind of shed light into the way i approach photo poetry so uh, my preferred mode of working um, at the moment, well, my sort of preferred poetry strand is object poetry um, at the moment. And um, something that's really interesting about object poetry um, is um, its flexibility, um, the, the flexibility inherent in this form to um, sort of to be presented within um, various environments. Um, and so while working on uh, various sculptures um, the last couple of months, I felt like I had to develop my photography skills, get a decent camera because, you know, um, especially in, you know, um, the current COVID landscape where everything has to be shared online and, you know, that face to face kind of has been stripped out, stripped down. Um, I've, I had to have, you know, decent photos of my objects to be able to send to magazines and, you know, our various online exhibitions, etc. So um, I started thinking a bit about more composition. So I started you know, just trying to, you know, photographing the object in a white background and then started thinking of how, um, what sort of environment would enhance, um, I suppose, the, the overall photo of the object. And that poses questions about the relationship between photography and poetry. I suppose that's one way to approach it, uh, out of the many ways, as we can see um, this evening. So I'll dive in right into um, the project which I'm pre presenting in the exhibition and the catalog, My Feathered Friend. For those who don't follow me on social media and uh, who I haven't, uh, whose head I haven't made too big, because uh, I talk about Mr. Feathers all the time <laughs> at the moment. It's so, I live in Guildford at the moment and there is this most beautiful little robin that just visits me several times a day uh for for too many months now and i hope it's forever until i'm you know for, for, for as long as i'm here and uh so i've been interacting with it um 
um, I, I always, so I work in the living room at the moment and the living room is a bit like um, a bombshell of just art materials everywhere and shit. Um, and so Mr. Feathers loves coming in. And then, uh, so I've been working on this, I was working on this installation uh, based on Lokta paper and it was quite massive. And Mr. Feathers would always come in and just tap on that, um, oh, the, the, pa the Lokta paper and the tapping would made a very distinct sort of, you know, oh, it was so articulate. And I thought, well, I have to do something with the locked paper and Mr. Feathers. Um, and of course, you know, by that time we were looking into curating this event. So I thought, right, let's just go for it. So the, uh, my feathered friend uh, lives in, a, in two versions, a tangible version and a film poem version. And I'll show you both. So um, the materials I've used for this poem uh, is locked paper, which is handmade paper from Nepal and cardboard. So here's the paper. Um, the very interesting thing about locked paper is that right now it, it looks a bit like, you know, a, you know, perfectly orange piece of paper with nothing, um, you know, uh, on it. Um, and as soon as you shed light behind it, it sort of lights up. Um, so in, it works perfectly, uh, you know, well, uh, when sunlight is out, not particularly in here. So in the catalog um, and the online exhibition, you'll see that I've placed these, I've taken the poem in, um, in various environments and I've just included one version in at the Guildford Castle to um, honor the very Guildfordian uh, Mr. Feathers and uh, included photos of Mr. Feathers himself on top of the poem and his little toes. Um, yeah, far too good. Well, no, not, not my poem, he's, he's, he's far too cute. Um, for the purpose of showing you how it would look in daylight, I've got a little um, light board. So you see that as soon as it comes in contact with light, um, it lights up. And um, I won't read it because um, I have recorded myself. So um, part of this text, um, features in a film poem that um, I've put together for this event. And I'm going to attempt to share now, uh, fingers crossed. Let's see. So can you give me some thumbs up that you can see that just to? It's, it's working fine. Fantastic. So I'll let you watch that then. One day at a time, when the sun stirs and flicks, when wood lightens, the rays about the course of sky, and there goes a patchwork of spring chime to tweak the seasons. So slender, so gentle, feathered with red gores. It hops on paths paved with shrubs and trees. A gilded temple to shorten the day. It leaps from gravel paths to thrash warbles in the red brick shade and off it goes again, branch by branch, to find its next leafy throne.
right. Um, so I think this is it from me and Mr. Feathers, and we both, um, yeah, look forward to hearing the rest of the poets tonight. Thank you, guys. Beautiful. And thanks to both of you. <laughs> uh, next up is Paul Hawkins, uh, also known as Bob Modem. Uh, who works mainly in poetry, visual art, performance, and has co-run Hester Glock, excuse me, Hester Glock Press with Cyrus Scotthorne since 2013. They've written a number of books, some collaborative, some not. And his most recent is Each What Volume One, a collection of poem brute-ish artworks. They've exhibited their visual art widely and have performed at many venues and festivals in the UK and Europe. And Paul is also one of the co-curators and organizers of this, uh, for which I give him many thanks. Uh, Paul, all yours. Thank you, thank you, Dave. And uh, yes, it's been um, it's been a tremendous evening, I think, so far. Uh, and um, I'd just like to thank everybody who's taken part in it. Um, but I'd also like to shine a light on um, Alejandro, Alex, from uh, Bristol po Photo Festival 2021, who, has done the back end of this whole thing uh, and it's gone pretty smoothly, pretty well, I think. So cheers, Alex. Uh, and also thanks to Dave, who's, who's been a very genial, engaging and thoughtful, considerate uh, host for this evening. And um, thank you all very much. Uh, I'm not gonna say very much. Um, uh, I've put together uh, a, a, an ex kind of fairly experimental, in some respects, um, very short film of work that features in the uh, Surfaces exhibition, as well as work that features in uh, in this limited edition pamphlet. Um, uh, and I, I just want to say, uh, in terms of photo poetry, <clears throat> uh, I like the disruption of the sanctity of the photo by adding text on it. And likewise, I like also uh, the disruption of the sanctity of the poem by putting a photograph behind it. Um, and uh, here's, uh, here's the film. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, I think uh, I, I may may have made some kind of technical error, but there was uh, there was supposed to be a 
an audio track um, that uh, featured my uh, voice doing things as well as uh, sounds uh, that didn't come across. I don't know if anybody heard it. No. Okay. No, unfortunately. Oh, oh well. Okay, not to worry. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, and next up is Stephen Fowler. Uh, and uh, we are going to have a short discussion about his project, uh, which I will share here in a second. So Stephen, uh, perhaps you'd like to say a little bit about the project and the collaboration with Bard Torgerson. Oh, thanks, David. Well done tonight. I know that we're going along so we can be brief here and thank you to you, Paul and Astra for inviting me. So I, I did a collaboration with the Norwegian avant-garde poet and, and novelist Bård Torgerson called Crowfinger. Um, and to a certain extent, it was part of a, a year of stuff I'm doing now until the end of the year where I'm publishing photo poetry, which began when we first met David at the course I taught at the Photographer's Gallery in London called The Writing Eye, where I began to theorize and explore photo poetry. So without waffling, essentially, the theorization I'd done around photo poetry had been that there are four possible ways to create it with the image and the text upon text upon the image um, of, to build a poem of images, i.e. to build language with images, um, or in, to take a picture of language. Um, and after all this faffing and all these various explorations of working with collage, of working with my own photography, one day Bord, um, who is known as a very radical artist in Norway, uh, I think trying to troll me, sent me very gentle uh, pastoral pictures of Norwegian nature. Although he's Norwegian, his sense of humor is hard to read, so therefore perhaps he wasn't trolling me. And so I just wrote upon them using paint. Um, and I deliberately saw that as a way to break up the beauty of the traditional composition of nature photography by writing um, offhand, uncorrectable poems, because I was using paint, where once you press return, you can't go back upon them. And so they're more fluid than my normal work. And also sometimes trying to make them so faint that they become part of the landscape. And I know when you bought a copy, David, you did say on Twitter, I can barely read them. And that, that made me so happy, <laughs> that made me so happy. Nothing could bring me more joy than the idea that my tricks and my alienation of readers have been massively successful. So Bord and I have been friends. This got published and then it was quite successful in Norway and no one could understand it because he's known as a very radical artist and these photos are very, well, they're lovely, but they're also but quite banal. And I think that's the point too. I, I think that my comment might have been, we don't have one of those images, but there's a couple where the text sort of runs very small and narrowly along the trunks of trees. Uh, yes. Which, which, pro which prompted, and, and you know, it, it, you know it, it led me to wonder to what extent, you know, the design of the work and the, the book and otherwise was meant to even recreate a little bit of the experience of, of being a little bit lost in the forest. Yeah, it was more to piss Bord off and it worked. <laughs> He wasn't overly happy that some of my text was unreadable because he valued the text more than I did. So to me, I really saw the, the actual material of the language as being sometimes so embedded in the landscape that it was frustrating, which seems to me to be both a joke, a valuable joke, but also perhaps one could draw out a poetics of indeed being lost or being hidden, language itself not being clear in its actual auspices, its appearance, as well as its semantic content. So yeah, you need a magnifying glass basically for some of them. Well, I, I probably need one for almost everything, but that, that's a different issue. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, I've had uh, some snotty emails about this book and there's nothing better in the world than someone <laughs> feeling your deliberate gesture as an accident. Uh, in that respect, how did you expect folks or did you think about sort of how people would try to read the book uh, other than Bard and, and, and annoying him? Well, that's it. I mean, later on in the year, thanks to Paul at Hester Glock and um, the Aleph, my selected photo poetry will come out as a, as a nice 
thick book. And then in a month, thanks to James at Steel Incisors, my selected collages will come out. And my book, Sticker Poems, has just come out. And they're all photo poetry in a sense. So for years and years, I've spent <laughs> way too long taking uh, film photos, deep editing software, marginal stuff, teaching courses with hundreds and hundreds of examples. So it, it brings me great joy that the first photo poetry I publish properly, people think is a technical failure in a sense. So what I really wanted to do with this is go back to that. In fact, it was, I think it was said in the first talk about the simplicity of what fo photo poetry might achieve when it's set out like this. So I thought I was being too clever often with photo poetry. I was trying to reinvent the wheel. I was trying to, I was so scared of doing a with you know, a juicy Ted Hughes, you know, a with, you know, a nice juicy picture of a nice face and then a nice poem of that face describing the face. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but I was so afraid of it. I was monkeying around and this brought it back. He sent me pictures. I wrote on top of them. I sent them to him, they got published. And, and there's a beauty in that simplicity with the little intricate inside workings here where my poems are trying to go against the way that humans see nature. Uh, it's trying to resist the idea that this is all beautiful because in fact nature loves to snack upon us, uh, etc. Uh, what well, seems like it might be a good note to wrap up on, but any other sort of comments you want to make about the, this project? Um, it was a joy to do and I would be a big huge advocate for Microsoft Paint so just a plug out there for the Microsoft Corporation, um, go paint. And thanks, David. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Astra. And thanks to the uh, 83 people who have stayed. It was 99. It was 105. But those of you who have stayed, you're the real ones. In, indeed. Uh, so uh, on that note, uh, many thanks to everyone uh, who attended and did stay with us. It has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, the work is amazing, and I really do encourage uh, everyone to explore this further uh, through the website and catalog, but mostly by going out and, and getting the books uh, and other work of these artists and, and supporting them. Uh, and hopefully, if, if you're new to this world of photo and visual poetry, hopefully we've made a few converts tonight and uh, encouraged you to uh, explore or, or even uh, try some of this out yourself. Um, again, the, the links to the exhibition and, and all else has uh, been posted in the website. Um, as I have been mentioning, um, we are going to wrap up um, shortly with the formal program and turn off the recording and unmute everyone. But for anyone who would like to hang around, uh, by all means, please do. And we're happy to just sort of chat and continue the conversation as we might have otherwise done in the hallway or, or pub. Um, and finally, many thanks again to the Bristol Photo Festival and, and to, to Alex uh, especially and, and to Tracy for all the help and support. Um, as this event was free, it would be most welcome for any voluntary donations uh, towards the continued provision of events like this. Um, and again, um, with that, uh, many thanks to everyone and have a good afternoon, evening. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll all uh, uh, raise a glass in, in just a moment. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. It's been a lovely night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Everybody. Yes, thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>